Well, howdy, y'all. Hey, look, I'm going to continue my education series. I'm going to jump ahead real quick, like way ahead, sort of off to the side of it. I'm going to be talking about Lamarck and epigenetics. I'm going to be doing this because uh, it needs to be addressed. Some videos I've been seeing. All right, so here we go. All right, uh, so Jean Baptiste Lamarck lived from 1744 to 1829. He is most famously known for his theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics or traits. A typical example of this is like uh, elephants in the trunks. Like uh, Lamarck believed that, that once upon a time, elephants all had short trunks. And that those that like, could reach farther sort of developed longer trunks incrementally. And then over generations, this acquired trait was inherited and grew and grew in the longer, longer trunks. Same thing we said with giraffes and reaching for trees. Believed, not that as it's known now, that giraffes use their necks in, in mating competition. It was believed that giraffes had long necks because they needed to reach up to the top of the trees. And giraffes that could reach the, the highest up to the top of the trees could survive the most. And so the effort to stretch and reach out incrementally made their necks longer and longer and longer. This is the traditional theory of the inheritance of the characteristics. Now, Lamarck and Charles Darwin agreed that life adapted and changed over evolution, so, or, or evolved over generations. They agreed on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but Darwin was decades later, and Darwin had a little bit more refined, a little more refined of a theory and a lot more data to back it up. Mm -hmm. Lamarck was just sort of thinking. Now, it was odd what later on with epigenetics we'll find out what Lamarck was kind of right about, but anything Lamarck was kind of right about was just sort of tangent and accidentally right about. Right, uh, there's Lamarck, or Mendel, Lamarck, and Darwin. You know, those three were all sort of having a sort of convergence towards the truth. Oh, plus there was also Alfred Russell Wallace. We'll talk about him later. Right now, what Lamarck was right about accidentally was a, a cancer. This a propensity to develop cancer it can be acquired handling certain chemicals or being in certain environments, being exposed to certain environmental factors, and then even if one's offspring are not in exposed to those same environmental factors or variables, uh, the propensity to develop that cancer or even other diseases can be passed on to the offspring. Right? Now, this is kind of goes into the study of epigenetics. Epigenetics uh, is the, the study of environmental chemicals, the, the effects environmental chemicals have on the expression of genes, generationally speaking, and that's the important part, generationally speaking. Epigenetics is about uh, affecting DNA on a molecular level to either encourage or inhibit the expression or functions of certain sections of DNA. Right? Typically, this is accomplished by ingestion of chemicals or other atomic or molecular substances. These substances cause the change in the expression or function of the DNA. But a change in diet, I mean like a change in the ingestion of certain food chemicals, food molecules, and to a lesser extent, a change in the biochemical, physiological environment and function and healthy function of the body can bring about expression change in genes or DNA. This change is again typically generational, right? These generational effects are obvious, as in the case of mice I will discuss, and most typically brought about by a change in diet. This is where epigenetics came in to modern day academia, diet. Which is, is usually because of a change in the surrounding environment. A change in diet is usually because of a change in the surrounding environment, like the planetary biological environment, in which the population being studied lives. This population that is being studied is usually adapted over generations and or acclimated and or agriculturated, if that's the word. And it is in these populations that we noticed epigenetic change first, and in which we still notice it most severely. So going to the whole bell curve thing, the founder effect, etc. later on, bottlenecking genetics later on. But my point is, and I'll make it up front, because I'm trying to make this a quick video, is that when Mark was only partially right, and even when he, he was right, it was by accident. Epigenetics is not Lamarckianism. Epigenetics is not traditional inheritance of fire characteristics in the Lamarckian sense. And there really is no inheritance of acquired traits in the genetic sense, in the Darwinian sense. All right? Now, the bump back to epigenetics and mice. Now, what most biological, like a decade ago, what they noticed was they could take mice they had bred over generations 
to, to sort of be disease-ridden, fat, lazy, cancerous, sort of stupid, sort of like your average American mouse, <laughs> your average American mouse, and then simply just by forcing a change in, in, in diet of just a, a simple molecular structure, uh, amino acid, or some sort of form of pure amino, some sort of triggering dietary molecule. Just by a simple change in that, they can take the fat, lazy, stupid, cancerous mice, the disease-ridden mice, and, and, and their offspring, their children, will be normal mice. This is what they're showing when they begin their change, and it's typically in diet. Now, true, in theory, someone can work out a lot and make themselves more fit, and thus the genetic environment in which their sperm meos can cause an effect, I guess, in theory. But what needs to be understood is that it hasn't been shown. In mice, what has been shown is diet. And where we found epigenetics in humans was in Sweden a few years back. Over a century, we've studied it. And in the very highly adapted, highly monitored, highly discreetly measured environment that is Sweden over the last hundred years, plus years, they noticed only in male populations where we would consider that there's a Y chromosome connection. That was it a father who was malnourished before puberty, going into puberty. His sons were less likely to die of heart disease. And then for times when there were too much food for males before puberty, this increased the grandson's likelihood of uh, dying of diabetes-related illnesses. But if the food surplus continued into the father's, the grandfather's son, and the son's father, into the second generation, if that prepubescent food surplus continued during the second generation's male time period, then the third generation male, the grandson's likelihood of dying of diabetes was balanced out. But if the second generation's food supply was low, was the first generation's food supply was high, the third generation was more likely to die of diabetes if their food supply was high. They had a normal rate of dying of diabetes if their food supply remained low. From generation two to generation three, and, and those are just the most concrete examples of epigenetics. There was a video I saw where someone was hauling off and making a very complex theory, balanced out theory, where they were jumping through a lot of hoops. And what they need to know is that yes, there is social Lamarckianism. This is why we tend to make them believe in the inheritance of acquired characteristics, right? but there is no biological Lamarckianism. Right? So you can inherit money from your father, you can inherit money from your bank, you cannot inherit muscles. Your father. Your father naturally has muscles. You may have a, you have a 50 50 chance of inheriting that natural tendency that naturally have muscles, but then you lose your mother's side of the family too. It's, it's, it's slightly more complex than what a lot of people would like to believe, and it's slightly simpler than many would dare hope. Okay? Well, that's an odd statement, but I'm going to try to keep this short. So there is social Lamarckianism, yes, there is inheritance of acquired social characteristics and traits naturally. But there is no biological Lamarckianism, not in traditional biological academic sense. And epigenetics is not Lamarckianism. And epigenetics primarily concerns itself with changes in diet and or physical biological exposure to certain carcinogens, mutagens, teratogens, and in other environmental substances. Also, just so you know, Bruce Ames, an excellent source, determined that 30% of all naturally occurring environmental substances are carcinogenic. In half of all man-made substances are carcinogenic. And this is essentially what epigenetics is talking about. Environmental molecular ingestion, either through air, water, or food, or even sex, that leads to changes in disease expression or function or propagation, the epidemiology in, in a population. Okay? That's all epigenetics is talking about. It's not talking about getting stronger, faster, generationally. Generation. Yes, if you're healthier, you're once per minute, you're probably going to be healthier too, naturally. But any changes that occur will probably occur primarily in diet. Stop eating crap in your body. You'll stop being polluted with crap. And you'll stop producing reproductive cells that are crap. And, yeah. All right. Well, you guys have a nice day. And always remember to go your own way. Yours truly. Yeah.